Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. Happy not long weekend, but at least it's it feels like the first official weekend of summer. And of course, uh, to mark that, we have Amanda Carpenter back on the podcast. Uh, good to talk with you, Amanda. Hey, hot Bulwark summer. Let's hey, do it. So should we talk about the least important um, political story of the day? Should we should start off that way? Because I, I got to work. That's how you want to kick off the weekend? I, I have to work up to my pillow guy. And, and the fact that the former and perhaps future president of the United States is actually listening to my pillow guy. I actually need to take a few deep breaths and work up to that. OK, so. <laughs> OK, so, you're the opposite so, of me. <laughs> um, and, 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 and since, you know, there's always that suspense about whether we're going to get the explicit rating. I wanted I wanted to end that that suspense early in today's podcast, because the least important political story of the day may be how truly fucked up the Republican Party in Texas is. Uh, you see the story that Al- Alan West, um, you know, fresh off attending this QAnon conference, a uh, well-known secessionist, is resigning as chairman of the Republican Party of Texas, like effective like in, ju- in July. And, and, the, and the buzz is that, that he might jump into this weird primary for attorney general. This is the one where you have the the indicted, corrupt incumbent Paxton, who's being challenged by George P. Bush, who is throwing every one of his, you know, other members of his family under the bus to suck up to Trump. And apparently neither of them is Trumpy enough or crazy enough for Texas, certain Texas Republicans. So Alan freaking West has to get into that race. So, Amanda. Cool. You know Can't these wait guys. to see what his Supreme Court briefs will look like. Oh, God, can you imagine? Now, Paxton's the guy that wrote the completely batshit crazy uh, uh, you know, lawsuit that was trying to get the Supreme Court to overturn the election. I mean, this guy's really out there. I mean, wasn't he busted for corruption at some point? And half of his I staff don't... has resigned because he's such a complete, you know. You know, you know I wanted to memory hole him after he was done being a Florida congressman, but then he carpet bagged his way to Texas for this. And now he's going to be, what did the people of Texas do to deserve this? Honestly? Well, they're, they're, whatever they've done, they're going to get it good and hard over a long period Ooh. of time. Okay. So, so I, I don't follow uh, Texas Republican politics uh, that closely, except that it's one of those state parties that has become crazier and crazier. It seems to be this contagion. And the fact that Alan West, who was a congressman from Florida, right? I mean, just, co- you know, correct me on all of this. He's a congressman from Florida who became Correct. the chairman of the Texas. OK, whatever. So <laughs> um, there's a, one of the uh, the apparatchiks in um, in Texas who's a re- re- Republican who every once in a while has these sort of spasms of independence is a guy named Matt McCoyak. By spasms, I mean, he gets over it and goes along with all the Trumpy you know, stuff as well. But he has an interesting thread on Twitter about this. He says it is now clear that Alan West's entire tenure as Texas GOP chair was intended to to do only what many suspected, provide him a platform for his political future, not an opportunity to build the party. Hmm. Huh. Who knew that that was going on in Republican politics? You know what I'm saying? Um, then he goes on saying, Ellen West inherited a strong party passed down from the heroic efforts of blah, 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 ably transitioned and sustained by the work ethic of blah, 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 after somebody else. Now the party is in the weakest financial position in at least 10 years. For seven plus months, our state chair has been unconsciously attacking our statewide officials, rallying with Alex Jones at the governor's mansion, attacking our new speaker and doing the rhetorical work of Texas. Texas Democrats. Now we are locked into an obscene and wholly unnecessary security contract at Texas GOP. Our field effort is decimated. We've done nothing to continue our massively effective voter registration effort. And RPT lost its finest executive director in somebody or other. Alan West has always been all about himself, leaving disaster in his wake, military career, Congress, uh, and now the Republican Party of Texas. And talks about our, that our next uh, chairman should be focused, serious, selfless, hardworking, blah, 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 blah. So it is kind Can of we just get into the logic here because, yeah, please, you know, he, he is right. But it is so annoying. And this isn't just limited to Matt. It extends to many people who when things go bad, when something like Alan West declaring for attorney general, objectively bad, the only argument that they really muster is that. Well, this is good, bad for the Republican Party because it's a bad outcome. Like, that's all right. And I, I do make those arguments occasionally because I know they're persuasive to those types of people. 
But where were you when he became chairman of the Republican Party? I mean, maybe Matt was speaking out about it, but a lot of people do this. There's like a small window where an event happens like this and they they find the courage to say, well, this is bad for the Republican Party and we shouldn't do it. Not because it's bad on its face, because he's an objectionable person that should be nowhere near public office. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, actually. Like, it's all, it's they, they, all just for for the good of the party, this and that. Well, I, okay, I well, Donald Trump was good for the party, so you're going to support him, right? Donald Trump gets out the vote, so you're going to support him. Like, if that's your only way of measuring the objective good of politics, just just shut up. Like, mute, mute. You know, I was thinking about this with some of the the analysis about the the, the craziness in Arizona with that uh, that bogus non audit you know fraud it's thing that, that's going on. That you know, some people are saying you know, well, you know, if Republicans want to run on this, you know, good luck with all of that. And then this seems to be that kind of that knee jerk response, like, is this going to help or hurt Republicans? At some point, and, and your point, I think, is you know, let's is, is a salient one, which is at what point do we step back and say? I don't care what the effect on the Republican Party is. The the effect on the country is terrible. Does anyone even think about this is objectively bad for America? This is bad for our democratic process. This is bad for the Constitution. This is bad for our political culture. I mean, I don't know whether or not Republicans are going to win on 2022, but maybe that's not the most important question we should be asking at the moment. Okay, Mike Lindell. (laughs) <laughs> I start off my newsletter today by saying we should we should actually ask the question, why are we talking about these people? And I have a video of Diamond and Silk talking about Mike Lindell, who, of course, is, is the my pillow guy. And this, this is one of the legacies of, of the Trump presidency uh, that this worth at least remarking on it are the number of fringe characters who have been elevated and brought into our discussion. You know, the only reason we're talking about Mike Flynn and his coups and diamond and silk and my pillow guy is because Donald Trump has embraced these nut jobs. So here's, here's the, here's the really bad news. I think of the day for people who just want to roll their eyes and it's easy to be numbed about this. Mike Lindell is a nut. He's crazy. He's, he's been, he's been talking about, you know, the, he's, he has evidence of the fraud, um, you know, all the voting machines that have been hacked and he's going to force the Supreme court to vote nine zero. He, he is predicting a unanimous vote by the Supreme court to overturn the results of the election. Okay. Actually, can we just play this? We get just a little, a little, little soundbite of, of of Mike Lindell, who apparently every six weeks predicts he's six weeks away from uh, from this this big Supreme Court uh, decision. This is this is this is a video of Mike Lindell. When the case we have right now gets to the Supreme Court in about six weeks, it's a called a quo warranto. Okay, oh, a quo okay. warranto, and this will if they accept it. This isn't, you guys. This isn't something where it's subjective. Going well, let's all talk about the evidence we have and. You know, maybe it's a 5-4 vote or 6-3. No, this will be 9-0. 9-0, everybody. And, and in fact, I'm putting out a little clip this week. It's called Absolutely 9-0. That's the name of the clip. And we're going to show you this evidence we have, which is cyber data, cyber footprints. They're called packets. You can't change them. Uh, you can't go back and doctor them. Just it's one hundred percent, and these are from the night of the election. They're so far, and it switches all five states. This and uh, the Supreme Court will vote nine zero. Uh, so you know what? It's like he's out trumping Trump. Have you ever heard the saying like when lobbyists get out and they they sort of brag joke about the fact that they get paid. Uh, to know members of Congress and members of Congress get for being members of Congress. Like yeah. Mike Lindell is making more off Trump than I think Trump is himself right now, at least in terms of traffic. I mean, he's running commercials. I am mean, looking at this thing in your newsletter, the code for my pillow. I mean, he's hawking pillows off Supreme court prophecies. It is amazing. Okay, so before we get people saying, oh, Kelly and Amanda, why don't you talk about important things? We want to talk about infrastructure. We want to talk about, uh, you know, HR, you know, 13, 14, whatever it is, you know, some big public policy. Here's Look, this is why we're talking about this, because as crazy as that is, as tempted as we are to laugh about that kind of bullshit, 
the president of the former president of the United States, the guy who is, I would say, the presumptive uh, Republican nominee in 2024 is listening to this guy. And I mean, and and my pillow guy thinks he is. He said, look, if Trump is saying he's going to be restored to the presidency in August, that's probably because he heard me say it. OK, so, you know, National Review, C, uh, Charles C.W. Cook is reporting, he's confirming Maggie Haberman's tweet the other day. He said, I, I can attest from speaking to an array of different sources that Donald Trump does indeed believe quite genuinely that he, along with former senators David Perdue and Martha McSally, will be reinstated to office. Big if true. Um, okay, this is deranged stuff. I mean, yeah, this it is, is it is deranged. But let me put one more impact on here and why we should be paying attention to this because it is playing out on the ground. I mean, what is happening in Arizona? I view is very serious, and it is laughable because it's so deranged. But I was listening to the election officials talk this week, and this one really brought it home for me. The, the fact that these ballot machines, you know, voting infrastructure, if you will, they're going to have to be thrown out because they're so corrupted by this, you know, fake fraud system. They're, they're destroying. I, I almost think it's sabotage at this point. Sure. I mean, you keep doing the audits, you get the machines, you break them so they can't be used again. What happens if you don't have machines in time for the next election? I mean, it's not like you go to Walmart and pick these things up. And they're ready to go. And all the Dominion, uh, you can't use Dominion anymore, really. Like, I, I think those are off the market. And so I, knowing that the machines are essentially being taken offline by a bunch of lunatics who just scrounge around enough pennies to pay for recounts or whatever this is, that seems like a pretty easy way to destroy the elections process. And I don't know what's going to happen. Like, so, hmm. so what do the Democrats have on their side? Pretty much Mark Elias, right? It because seems to me that guy has losses, yeah. Yeah, does all the work. He's not going to be perfect all the time. I, what, what is the game plan here? I don't think there's a game plan. Hope for HR1 to pass. That's, that's not happening. There needs to be a ground game plan. And there's got to be, you know, a lot of local Democrats, Facebook groups organizing, watching and heading this stuff off before it starts. Because I, I don't know, just w once I heard about the ballot machines. No, it's bad. Essentially being destroyed. I just the first word that came to mind was sabotage. Yeah, well, I'd say I say sabotage. I, this is a, this is a great point. Um, I think it's a lot worse than that. I mean, I, I, I mean, how, what are the prospects that believing that the, that Trump should be reinstated in office will become a, the next litmus test for the Republican Party? <sighs> I mean, you kind of know how it goes. There's kind of this deep intake of breath with people going, this is crazy. We shouldn't really be talking about this. And then Trump will, will you know, will start tweeting out or saying at the rallies that he should be reinstated. Everybody goes, well, maybe he should be reinstated. You know, I mean, the, the sort of. No, the no, here's the first test. Who's saying he won't be? Yeah, well, exactly. He's sitting quiet about it. <laughs> well, also, I mean, I'm looking at this tweet from from somebody. Um, was it Asha R Rangappa? You work yeah, with her. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. She said, Trump's we claim that he will be reinstated this summer is is a repeat of the same playbook that led to January 6. Give your followers false hope and a completely unattainable outcome so that when it inevitably does not happen, you can channel their disappointment into rage. So this is the remember a clown with a flamethrower still has a flamethrower. This is really dangerous. I think stuff. about that all the okay. time. So I want to talk about the Oath Keepers because I know that you want to talk about that. But I, I, can I just talk about I have to I, I'm just watching the way the conservative media continues to handle this. I mean, so far, people are going, this is really crazy. It's diluted. It's deranged. Right. Charles Cook, Charles C.W. Cook, by the way, who in October wrote the essay in National Review. Trump, maybe after watching Trump for four years, he goes, hmm, Trump, maybe another four years. Well, now he's he's saying, look, you know, the scale of Trump's delusion is quite startling. And then at great length, he goes on to say that, 
you know, even if it was true the 2020 election had been stolen, which it was not, his belief would still be absurd. We don't do this sort of thing. He talks about however bad it got, Donald Trump would not be reinstated to the presidency. This is not how America works, how America has ever worked or how America can ever work. American politicians do not lose their reelection races, only to be reinstalled later on, as might uh, the second place horse in a race whose winner was disqualified. The idea is otherworldly and obscene. Okay, and yet here we are talking about this idea that everybody knows is obscenely stupid because of Donald Trump and the fact that he has to go to great lengths. But I want to read you this paragraph, if you bear with me, Amanda. Please, your show, Charlie. Okay, this, this, <laughs> this, this, this is the guy who, after four years of Trump, said Trump, Trump, maybe. And I'm going to I'm going to quote James Madison at the end of this, just so you know. So for, for people who think <laughs> this is, we have not elevated this sufficiently. So. Having gone through the fact that the former and perhaps future president of the United States is engaging in absolutely obscene delusion, Charles Cook seems unsure what to do about it, if anything at all. So this is what he writes. To acknowledge that Trump is living in a fantasy world does not wipe out his achievements or render anything else that he has said incorrect. Mm -hmm. It does not endorse Joe Biden or hand the Republican Party over to Bill Kristol or knock down an inch of the wall on the border. It merely demands that Donald Trump be treated like any other person, subject to gravity, open to rebuttal and liable to be laughed at when he becomes so unmoored from the real world that it is hard to know where to begin in attempting to explain him. So this is where in my newsletter today, I did quote James Madison. I said, as James Madison might say, oh, for fuck's sake. I mean, we are still at the let's laugh at the silly man who is still a pretty good president stage of things. I mean, really? So this is it. Yeah, we don't actually have to like take any political steps or turn the Republican Party over to people who've been right about Donald Trump or find a way to reject him. Um, and so I have kind of apologetically have to say that, you know, acknowledging that the president, you know, that he's completely crazy doesn't wipe out his achievements as president. This is the problem is that even faced with this, there are people who go, hmm, Donald Trump, maybe. Yeah. How is the play except for the insurrection, Mrs. Lincoln? OK, so having and I, I agree with this analysis, though, that, that raising this crazy idea and raising fake expectations will feed the kind of anger and uh, alienation and disillusionment that does lead to political violence. I think this is a real thing. Uh, so uh, we we've learned a lot in the last week about the Oath Keepers. And this is a point that we've made several times on this podcast. And I'm sorry if people find it repetitious, but this this thread is ongoing. It is, it is not when we talk about January 6th, it's not some discreet one time one off moment in the past. This is something that is a real ongoing threat to this country. Yeah. And I was very, very happy they had Scott McFarland on the other day because I think I've mentioned on previous podcasts and live streams that he is really, I think, the only one following every single one of these arrests. He, he's, and, a big, he's a big fan of yours. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was, that was really nice <laughs> to hear, too. Um, we, I, we've never met in real life. Um, but the Oath Keepers is something to keep an eye on. They were organized. I don't know how much listeners know about this group, but they recruit former members of military and law enforcement to continue pr protecting and defending the country according to their oath. Right. Like that's the whole idea. They want to protect the Constitution. They show up at these events. I, I think you'll also remember when during the Kelly Loeffler race, I was very alarmed that these people were showing up as her private security uh, to escort her around. It's the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, like this loose group of far right militias. Right. So they, they have been showing up at all these events. I really think Georgia was a staging grounds for everything that happened on January 6th. But when you look at these documents and what they were saying to each other, it is incredible how much they were thinking and planning for insurrection. But the twist was they didn't see themselves, of course, as the insurrectionists. The insurrectionists were this conglomeration of Antifa and everybody that was in on the steal. Anyone that wanted to help certify 
Joe Biden's election. So the insurrectionists were this loose conglomeration of Antifa and anyone that wanted to certify Joe Biden's election. So in their minds, what they were telling each other is that they were going to stand guard and protect the patriots that were going to Donald Trump's rally on the 6th. They were even there the night before. Oh, and guess what? Some of them were providing security for Roger Stone. Weird. Um, and so Weird. they were going to be there to provide security. Oh, and, and if things got bad, this is what they were counting on. They were counting on having violent clashes in the street. And then at that point, they hoped Donald Trump would declare the Insurrection Act. They would be called up as the militia. Their friends would bring in heavy arms from all the surrounding towns in Virginia. And then they would go in and restore law and their order and service on behalf of the president. That sounds crazy pants, but that is exactly what they were telling each other. And if you look at everything that Donald Trump was essentially saying about insurrection, starting with June 1st, with the clearing of Lafayette Square, all the way through, through January 6th, he made it very clear he was willing to deploy military force to put down his political opposition. And then throughout that time period, all the military community was rightly freaking out, saying, we're not going to do this. Um, this is not appropriate use of military. So where did the Oath Keepers get the idea that they would serve as Trump's personal shock troops? To me, that, that is not a coincidence. And that is a key question. I want the January 6th commission, committee, whatever it is, to explore. Because all that talk about insurrection and what those people like the Oath Keepers would do, their communications with people like Roger Stone and others will be very important. Yes, and and, and adding urgency to all of this, and I, I again, we've talked about this before, is I really do sense the normalization of the idea of insurrection and political violence uh, to deal with, you know, the radical left threat. This is actually you know, being written about it is being published. Um, uh, you know, there's a publication called American Greatness, which is sort of uber MAGA. They've been very sort of almost, you know, fascist curious. Neo-fascist. Yeah, neo-fascist curious. And they, they, they're publishing articles uh, by former military people with close ties to Trump talking about uh, military coups, endorsing military coups. There's a piece um, that I cite in my newsletter today. Um, by someone who uh, says that the uh, seditionists are, you know, they're victims, you know, they're being oppressed, uh, they're being persecuted, and that we ought to elect the the seditionists, the, the rioters to Congress, that they would be better in Congress than the people who are there now. Now, maybe that's just simply trolling. But you look at the roster of people who are contributing to that. And, and look, you know, th this is, it would be nice to say that this is just totally the fringe. But more and more, you know, people on the right are being drawn into all this. And I guess mm -hmm. we've seen this so many times in the past where crazy ideas are out there. The initial reaction is that's crazy. And then it becomes accepted. Yeah, if people are interested in how people get sucked into this, one of the Oath Keepers, I, I'm not sympathetic to her, but I think how she got into it makes sense for people looking for reasons about how this happens. And so number one, you'll find this interesting. The head of the Oath Keepers, uh, Stuart Rhodes, who has yet to be um, hit with an indictment, I think. I, he's still sort of hanging out there. Um, he is a Yale Law School graduate. You'll appreciate that. And also a former pa uh, staffer to Ron Paul, as well, as well as a former member of the military. Mm. And so he... He, you know, he recruits these former members of the military. And this woman, Jessica Watkins, um, is a former, I think, Army. She was living in Ohio. And she was just kind of lost um, through the pandemic, didn't really have a great job. Her and her boyfriend opened up a bar called the Jolly Roger. And then the pandemic hit. And things weren't happening. She felt things like were sort of getting out of control. And she wanted to do something. And so she essentially just started Googling around and found this group that were looking for people who wanted to help their country, right? And so I think she ended up going down to a couple of these rallies to provide security, right? Because things were heating up with Black Lives Matter protests. There was violence in the streets and she wanted to do something. I, I think that's a very 
natural instinct, especially for someone that was in the military, that was trained to protect and defend. I mean, once you hang up the uniform, you don't hang that up. And so that was naturally channeled into saying, okay, I'm going to protect these patriots on the street. If you're sort of a right leaning person with that mindset. And then all of a sudden, she's going to stop the steel rallies. And even her boyfriend, I think, talked to Vice or Daily Beast or someone um, and said, yeah, it, I didn't want to go anymore. This wasn't for me. We weren't really doing anything. But then she kept going. She went to the Capitol and she just kind of got lost. She was the one making plans to have this kind of bug out plan to go to Kentucky where she couldn't be found with drones afterwards. And so it's just... <sighs> I, this isn't for all members of the military, clearly. But when you train someone to want to do good things for your country and bad actors take advantage of that, bad things happen. And even in later charging documents, you know, she kind of says, I'm humiliated. I can't believe I did this. And maybe that's because she flipped and is providing information. I don't know. But to me, this is just a very sad case. She's going to face the repercussions of it as she should. but. Anyone looking to see why this happened, I would encourage to read about Jessica Watkins. Speaking of January 6th, I want to get your take on this. Um, Vice former, Former Vice President Pence gave a speech yesterday in which he made a subtle, well, it, different than the last uh, speech he gave down in South Carolina, where he appeared to create a little bit of daylight between himself and Trump. Let me just play this and get your, and get your thoughts on what Mike Pence is, uh, is up to here. As I said that day, January 6th was a dark day in the history of the United States Capitol. Mm. But thanks to the swift action of the Capitol Police and federal law enforcement, Violence was quelled. The Capitol was secured. And that same day, we reconvened the Congress and did our duty under the Constitution and the laws of the United States. You know, President Trump and I have spoken many times since we left office. Hmm. And I don't know if we'll ever see eye to eye on that day. Hmm. But I will always be proud of what we accomplished for the American people over the last four years. So what is what is that, Amanda? That is that a half glass, half? I mean, what what he, he you know, starts off by saying we've talked about it. We don't agree. But, you know, it's still totally awesome, despite the fact that he tried to overthrow the government. What what is what is what is, what is Pence play here? Uh, well, first, I just have to say, I don't I don't know what that fool thinks that we're like, wait, who's buying this? Who is yeah. buying? I mean, if people want to re watch his speech in full, because he is just acting out every persona possible, telling terrible jokes. This is no doubt the most important part of the speech. And I, I think it has three parts, which are worth dissecting. The, the first part where he talks about it being a dark day and a tragedy as if he had nothing to do with it. It was, a, it was a dark day that was of the Trump-Pence ticket's own making. It wasn't like Donald Trump was just doing all this all by himself. You ran on that ticket, Mike Pence. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you got kind of quiet when Trump did the crazy stuff, but that doesn't ignore the fact that you were on the ticket. You were his vice president. Yeah, but Anybody. he, but he, but he, wait, come on now. But he did the right thing. I mean, that, that, that was the- What we do? Yeah, well, he he didn't go along with the you know stealing the election. He certified them. He he stood up against Donald Trump. That's why they were yelling, "Hang Mike Pence!" I mean, think about how history would have been different if Mike Pence had, in fact, gone along with Donald Trump. What might have happened on January sixth? I mean, I hear that point, and yes, but this is part of Mike Pence's ruse that he's pulling now. When he gives these speeches, he wants people to look at him and say. Oh, you're the good one. You were the good one. You were the good part of the Trump administration. And what I'm saying, he was not because he enabled and went along with it every step of the way. But not and every step of the way. registers well, a complaint wait, now but, saying but, it was but a dark not, day. But, okay, but that's just wrong. Yeah. It's not every step of the way. I mean, you know, I mean, really, he went along until, with it. Until almost, January 6th, right. he, he signed the paper he was supposed to? Yes, 
Come well, on. well, but uh, I'm trying to get what he's trying to do now, because clearly he was offended by what happened. But he being typical to Mike Pence, he's unwilling to but really call a oh, wait that he's willing to call it out. Um, but it, I mean, he's unwilling to call it. out. I just thought that was a, an interesting sentence. B- bizarre where he basically says it's a dark day. It's a yeah, dark it's day. Very interesting. But it's not that dark that I'm going to break with Trump. So he wants to have it both ways. I guess the question I'm getting is. Is it possible for him to do both of those things to say, okay, that was terrible what happened, but I'm still on the team. So he's trying to find a way to straddle. Does that ever work? I I don't think so, because I don't think people accept halfway and half measures in politics. I mean, his speech, I, I think what happened during his speech in South Carolina, it didn't really sell. And so now he's in New Hampshire trying something a little bit different, but I, I can't tell you how much it bothers me to think that he can project the idea that he was just a passive player in what happened on January 6th. He may have signed the paper in the end, but he was a part of everything that led up to it. And for him to describe it as like a dark day, like a bad weather day, as you know, this storm just passed over the Capitol. No, No, nobody had any idea how this could happen. Bullshit. He knows how this happened. He was in the White House when all this crazy stuff was going on, when all the communications with Sidney Powell and the screaming matches and Mike Lindell, where was he? And he didn't have boo to say about it. So I don't want to hear that he did the right thing in the end when he is one of the reasons it happened. I mean, it is, it is infuriating. And then when he sort of takes credit, well, oh, don't make know, me the do violence this. was called don't, with don't, law enforcement. Don't, don't make let, me, let me just finish this point. Yeah, don't make so, This was called with law enforcement as if everything ended well. It did not. No, it people didn't. People were killed. Law enforcement members were hurt. And I don't know if Mike Pence has bothered to talk to any of them. Has he talked to Michael Fanon? Has he talked to Sergeant well, Gunnell that was on well, Don Lemon last uh, night begging for people to acknowledge his pain, talking about how much it hurt him to see people deny it and be unwilling to investigate it? This wasn't just a passive thing. But then you listen to Mike Pence's voice where he goes from this at- passive thing. It was a dark day. The violence was quelled. but then leaps into active voice. But I am so proud yes. to be a member yes. of the Trump administration. And we are proud of our accomplishments. What, were you proud of Lafayette Square? Was that a good one? Child separation? Uh, impeachment one? Uh, the, the Mueller investigation? I mean, he has so much dirt on his hands. And then he wants to walk in front of the cameras like, I'm the good one. Give it a rest. Okay. I, don't make me do this. Do, do not, don't make me do this. I, I, I think that you need to do make it. distinctions between everything you're saying. I mean, his, his toadyism became clown-like. The way he went along, he became the ultimate enabler. I mean, it was like it was a competition between him and Lindsey Graham, who could be the biggest fluffer of this president. But really Gross. you you do have to say that that something did happen on January 6th it could have gone the other way that How that, do you know that he wasn't is, trying wait, to save uh, his own ass uh, and Am- get out of that administration Am- Am- Amanda okay now, OK, maybe he was trying to save his own ass. But what I'm saying is and I'm not trying to defend him in any way. I think that I think that his vice presidency was at I'm going to make it clear. Absolutely disqualifying. I think this game he's playing right now is just, you know, is 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 is, is, is appalling. But I do think that it's worth looking at among the extraordinary things that happened that day that Mike Pence did something that he literally never did ever in his vice presidency, which is to stand up and defy Donald Trump on an important issue in the most public way possible. So this is not one of the there, there's not a total continuum. There's actually a very significant break where he did this, but then he can't sustain it. I mean, here his life was threatened. The life of his family was threatened. You know, he had people saying, hang Mike Pence. He and specifically that's why I think he signed it. He speci- well, he spe- it would have been easier for him in many ways to simply have gone along with MAGA world. I don't know. I, we, we, I don't we, know. We, I can't get that far into the head of Mike Pence. I completely hear what you're saying, and I am happy for all the pushback. But I, I, I look at him, and I think that he is just as bad as Trump. 
Uh, oh, okay. Well, no, actually, well, yeah, he's, he's, he's awful, but Trump is in a category of himself. I and mean, this is, this is where you have to put, you know, you have to put okay, Donald who, Trump in a box. Worse, the guys at Charlottesville who dressed up in Nazi uniforms with tiki torches or the guys that just walked alongside him and didn't wear the nasty uniform. That, that That's what it is to me. Um, I would say Tucker Carlson's the worst. <laughs> Okay, let me explain what I'm saying. That's, these that's guys, a term. These guys, these guys, okay, well, let me explain what I'm, I'm, I'm coming at here. Is that go, is, go, go. Is, is is that you know the 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 more prominent you are, the greater the the, the, the guilt. So you have these these ignorant mouth breathing uh, incels who who marched in Charlottesville. Okay, they're they're ignorant bigots, and most of them were probably dumb as a box of rocks. Whatever. It's the guys who. Um, decide they're going to exploit it, who take the ideology and put it out to millions of people when, in fact, they know exactly what they are doing. So in terms of like who's actually worse, I would say that what Tucker Carlson does on the air is worse than the morons marching around with the tiki torches. Okay, C- can we switch to China for a second? This is a weird scale. I'm going to have to think of a way to evaluate this. Uh, oh, okay, uh, okay. So... <laughs> 32 years ago today, 32 years. You don't remember this because you probably you weren't even born, but I remember this. No, I, I, I remember 32 years ago, um, the the massacre at Tiananmen Square, uh, when you had uh, potentially thousands of pro-democracy demonstrators who were um, who were uh, either killed or, or injured in the communist regime uh, in Beijing, uh, not only was not delegitimized by that, it has grown more powerful, uh, richer and more ruthless since then. And I guess I'm sitting here looking at a, a, a number of stories, including Mona Charon's just outstanding piece the other day on the on the one child policy, uh, looking at the uh, what we're learning about uh, the 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 origins of covid and the way that the regime there covered that up, whether it came intentionally or unintentionally from the a laboratory, which we do not know. Um but I guess the, the question that I keep coming back to is, why is China not a pariah nation in the world? I mean, I know the easy answer is because they're so rich and because we want to make money off of them. But, you know, when you think of the the indignation aimed at other pariah nations that are tyrannies or racist regimes or apartheid regimes or have engaged in atrocities, you know, the world has has found ways to isolate them and punish them. And yet China is engaged in wide, you know, wholesale genocide right now. They have been uh, abusing women, taking away their right to choose in the most oppressive manner for years. This is a regime that may have, you know, caused the, the, the death of millions of people around the world. And yet China is maybe unpopular, but it's not a pariah. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think number one is that the pain and suffering that the government inflicts upon its people has never really been made visible to the American people in a way that we actually have to grapple with it. Yeah. Um, And that's largely because of the censorship in that country and the command and control of their government, which it works for them. Right. Um, You know, we barely see some images of of the camps. And so if you don't see it, it doesn't matter. And so let's just keep getting all our cheap electronics and plastics from China. Do you Um, you remember all of the people who were arguing that we need to do business with China and open up the markets in China because that would be a way to democratize them? And that clearly has not worked, has it? Yeah. And I I'm still very sympathetic to that argument, but you, you can't just do it. On the business side, the government also has to be working to ensure that there are human rights that come in exchange for that flow of business, which we have never, ever done. And it's not just a government problem that we have in America. It's a business community problem. Oh, yeah. NBA, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Big Hollywood. Yep. Yep. Uh, no one wants to risk a buck. And so, you know, I've it, it's extremely sad. And I was hopeful, remain hopeful that the Biden administration would do more on the international front, just because I see, you know, Biden's experience in the Senate as a foreign policy chairman, his interest in the area. I I think he has a lot of smart people who could be doing more visible work and pressing this issue further. 
um, that was one of my expectations, not just with China, but just just more around the world, more hmm. um, exporting the virtues of democracy, especially when we're getting uh, all these reports from Belarus and Turkey and everywhere else. I, I feel like his not not just him as president, but the people that he brought into this administration would be equipped to handle this. And I, I really hope they they would do more to make it visible and pressure our American companies to acknowledge and take note of what they're doing. And I, I understand we're not going to cut off business with China. Yeah, we're, we're addicted. But, but we, we've got to do something, you know, like Reagan did when he said that we should be a shining city on top of the world to give people hope and give something to strive for. I mean, I, I would hope that in exchange for doing business, we can export some yeah. of those ideas at the very least and raise the plate of the people being abused on the international stage. I, you know, that's, well, that's I, something I would hope and pray for. I, I have a radical thought here um, that that China's that China's behavior is so awful. It has become such a rogue state that there is there's room for a bipartisan crackdown on China, that this is one issue that despite all mm -hmm. the fact that we're divided on everything else, that I think there's going to be a bipartisan consensus that China needs to be uh, confronted and reined in and, and punished, and that perhaps that we ought to wean ourselves from our addiction to to China. I actually feel that that, that is possible. OK, speaking of bipartisan. Well, we just want one, one yeah, quick yeah, point sure. on that. Yeah. One thing that I would like to be part of this discussion is our. Uh, the pet peeve of mine is just over American consumerism and reliance on cheap, flimsy, disposable things. I mean, this is not only bad for our international relationships, it's bad for the environment, right? Like, can we get the environmentalists on this perhaps? I mean, all of this plastic that comes in the world. And the only reason we talk about China it has to do with like carbon offsets and stuff they put into the air. It, it is a much bigger problem than that. And the American consumer has a lot of responsibility here as well. Well, I, I, I agree. So, so speaking of bipartisanship, it, it, it seems increasingly likely that or, uh, evident this infrastructure deal is just not going to happen. Uh, the Republicans are rejecting the latest uh, tax offer from from Joe Biden. Uh, I'm not sure where they're going on this because I saw one interview with Joe Manchin yesterday where he's very, very clear that he doesn't want to even vote for this under, under uh, reconciliation unless there's Democratic supports. And then you have this report out of Politico that progressive are losing their minds because they don't want Biden to give up anything. They they think that two trillion dollars is kind of the bottom line. That's already the compromise. So uh, Biden's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place here. And, and I guess I guess the question is, I, I've written about this before that, that I, I support the the tradition of the filibuster. But right now, it's pretty evident that if they keep the filibuster, and there may be no way to get rid of it, that J Joe Biden and the Democrats are are going to go into the midterm elections without being able to accomplish much of anything. I mean, there's, there is nothing on their agenda that is going to get through um, if, in fact, it you're, you're relying on 10 Republicans to vote with you. I mean, it's we, we are we're about to see this this grinding gridlock. Yeah, I'll, I'll hold up hope for police reform, perhaps just okay, because may, Scott has been working on this. But this is sort of the McConnell way, right? Uh, McConnell doesn't want to do anything. He deploys one person, whether it's Tim Scott or Susan Collins or Shelley Moore Capito, to go work with the Democrats, make a big show of it. They work on it for ever, ever, ever. McConnell signals that he'll keep his mind open. And then as soon as it comes back, he slams the door. Yeah. This, this is the McConnell way. Um that said, Joe Manchin, if I, I I like where he's coming from, but at some point you can't just say, I want bipartisan votes, someone else go find them. Go write a bill. Go write some bills. Say what is. I mean, he keeps going to the White House like Shelley Moore Capito, you go work it out, which by the way, it is kind of funny that both West Virginia senators are now negotiating the infrastructure bill, right. which I think will send much more money to the big cities in urban areas than it will West Virginia. So I, that's, that's, that's great for West Virginia, but I'm not sure for the priorities of the infrastructure bill, it makes a ton of sense. Um, well, what's the, we're, that, well, that's well, what we're doing. West Virginia ought to end up at the end of the day with, with more pork than anybody else. I mean, if, if, if you want to have every single. That, what's funny about Manchin is that he isn't really trying to play that game. He he's playing the game to get Republican votes more on the cultural issues, you I, know, yeah. guns, that he's not he's not trying to bring home the bacon. 
I think maybe what they're going to need to do is they will need to have a series of votes to demonstrate again and, you know, over and over and over again that he's delusional in thinking that there's going to be a, a bipartisan majority for some of this stuff. You know, he 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 was quoted yesterday as saying something like, let's, let's have a revote on the January 6th commission. Let's do that over again. No, it's not going to be any different. Um, I mean, but I mean, that's one of those like, hey, uh, Joe, if you can't get enough votes for that, what makes you think you're going to get enough votes for anything? Now this yeah, is that's, hey, could you help me out with this because I'm 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 struggling to remember. Do you remember how long Republicans agonized and sweated and debated and went back and forth on whether to uh, drop the filibuster for Supreme Court justices? Because I don't. I don't remember that. I don't remember it being a thing at all when they decided that we're going to have to eliminate, we're going to have to do the nuclear option for Supreme Court justices and have them uh, confirmed on a mere majority vote. I don't remember that that took more than like five minutes. They said, we want a Supreme Court justice. We think that that's really important. So the filibuster is gone and they just did it. They didn't dick around with it. They didn't agonize about it. They just said, fuck it, we're doing it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's because Harry Reid nuked the option for other judges first. So that was an right. easy play. It was to an easy play. Back. Well, how come this is not an easy destruction? Play? Why is this so well, hard? <laughs> what happens when Mitch McConnell has 51 votes? I mean, you want to talk about scenarios. I, this is where Joe Manchin is right. What happens when there's 51 votes when Donald Trump Jr. is president? And they decide to do whatever they want in elections well, and I, say that there's I, only I, one day and you can only vote between 10 and 2 with, you know, one red shoe and one blue shoe. I mean, this this twists uh, back real hard. I, well, real I, I think that's right. And that that is the strongest argument that you don't do it. Um, but I do think that at some point when we talk about the legitimacy of, you know, constitutional uh, of a constitutional republic, uh, that legitimacy also rests on the ability of government to actually do things. If the public, be, you know, be, you know, starts to believe or, you know, obviously recognizes that the government can't actually get stuff done, then that's going to be a problem for I think going forward, and I think that that's we're we're faced with a prospect of many years of this now, where nothing gets done. Now, okay, having said I, that, I wonder then, if one thing to do, because I am very sympathetic to the Democratic complaint that because of the rules, Republicans get their priorities through right, in terms right. of tax cuts and judges, but because of the filibuster, they can't get anything through. Well, maybe just reverse it back and make have everything have sixty votes and grind it to a halt for everybody. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't know how they're going to resolve this. You're, you're referring to the argument that says, so wait, um, you, you, it only takes it only takes 50 votes to um, low, cut taxes, but it takes a super majority to raise taxes. There seems to be something wrong. I don't know. That seems to be the problem here. So I, I don't mm -hmm. know whether what's going to happen with the infrastructure deal. I, I guess I'd always assume that they were going to find a way to pass this. Um, I'm starting to wonder right now and in, in part by. Uh, because I, I wonder how much room now uh, the Biden administration has to negotiate. If Joe Manchin has decided that he's just simply going to vote no, and you have progressives in the House saying we're we're gone if if you if it's not two trillion dollars, uh, it it could be a very messy political summer for the president. I, I think this is this is what I would propose. Joe Biden should go to Manchin and Capito and say write a bill that will get sixty votes. I don't care what it is write a bill that will get 60 votes, pass it, and then do whatever, whatever else the Democrats want with the reconciliation. So you can have the bipartisan bill, you can have the big lib bill, and everybody gets what they want, except for budget hawks. That's pretty good, actually. That is, that is not a bad idea. So I think we probably should close on a positive suggestion <laughs> like that. Mr. We fight about something else. That was fun. <laughs> Miss, Mr. Mr. President, listen to Amanda Carpenter on this. This is a really, really good idea. Amanda, have a great weekend. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. <laughs> you too. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday and we'll do this all over again.